thinking beyond zeros and ones i am nisha kumar um fossi disclaimers so all the data behind the visualizations are public um and i will put the sources in the slides uh i do not have the source code that makes the visualization simply because i am very bad at it and the source code is very hacky uh so i didn't have time to clean it up and like publish it that's why i don't have it but it's all made with fos uh curl jq awk python numpy all of the huh oh yeah <laughs> shout out to jq yes <laughs> uh it's is it streaming i have no idea it's like 10:45 oh okay well let me know if you can't hear me or is the oh the people on the stream cannot hear me i have to be like eating the mic <laughs> I don't know. I'm able to hear myself on the mic. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay. So, um I use Obsidian for some of the visualizations. Obsidian is not open source, but it is free to use. Um all the drawings are CC by ND, they're mine. Um uh, do whatever you want with them, just uh, don't like uh as long as you give me credit for it and the slides are made with google slides which is not fast but uh free if you are willing to give away your privacy <laughs> with that out of the way um so currently i work in a cloud organization we make um and deploy thousands and thousands of services uh, all the time uh just like all the other cloud companies so um this is the situation that i'm in right now this is the company that i work for so when i look at software i'm looking at lots and lots and lots of software um i specifically work in the cyber risk management team that's within um oci and the team is meant to like the our purpose is to look at project what the long term risks for the cloud would be so we usually um we're not looking at you know incident like uh, things like incident responses so we don't look at oh uh, is something's down uh what's the root cause and how do we fix it we look more at okay how many times did this service go down or how many times did a developer have this problem how many uh instances of this kind of situation do we have do we experience um how many of a particular particular type of incident do we see out in the wild and how might it affect us those are the things that we're looking up at so um that we categorize as we call it risk um my background is mostly from a devops perspective and writing devops tooling so i contributed to a lot of open source projects and i maintain a couple of open source projects that are involved in like do some devops tooling um or that you can use in your devops pipeline so um my perspective being in a security organization cuz the cyber risk management team is in a security organization in the cloud uh, in the cloud organization so it's a weird perspective for me because i come from like making from the developer side and so this is like a learning experience for me as a developer in a security organization security organizations think very differently about software than uh, developers and so the purpose of my talk is to just um take a step back and look at the differences and think about some way of bridging those differences and that's where the last bit about me comes in which is 
a long time ago, I used to work in manufacturing. So my degree uh, is in electrical engineering, and I did a master's in RF engineering, so that's radio stuff. And I worked for three years at a semiconductor uh, manufacturing plant or like company. Uh, and in that role, mostly what I did was statistics. So looking at large quantities of data uh, coming out of the production line and thinking about and looking at trends and patterns and uh, relationships and you know what's an indication of a thing that's going to happen if we don't put some controls on it. So it very much is in the vein of like risk management but not in the same way as software uh, does risk management. It's completely different, and there's a reason for that. It, it's because software like, has never, we've never thought of developing software as like something in a production line, but right now, we generate so much software that it's beginning to look like we're doing this um, like a production line. So that's what this talk is about. Um, let me talk a little bit about how we currently do cyber risk management. So number one, we gather data. Our data is basically JIRA tickets. And I don't, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> not a very good source of data because JIRA tickets are often not very well documented. Um, but that's what we have, so that's what we use. Um, we look at patterns in the data about like what went wrong, what were the root causes, and that's how we analyze, okay, th this is an existential threat, this is like something that is coming it looks like it's going to happen pretty soon, so we need to keep an eye on that. And so we identify our hazards based on what the JIRA tickets tell us. And then we go off and implement mitigation. So we, we have uh, uh, programs that we uh, put out for developers to start putting in those controls, like, okay, we, we have a situation here where Developers seem to be creating, you know, um, not using two-factor or not using multi-factor authentication in these areas. We should identify uh, those teams and get them to start implementing multi-factor authentication. It's just an example of what our, you know, initiative programs would be. But this is basically like targeted towards mitigating those risks, and then we repeat go through the same process. Okay, now that we've implemented everything, let's see what happens, like whether we start monitoring and seeing whether we have any um, like new stuff crop up or whether uh, we still see the problem, in which case like we try to figure out what to do next. So this is very similar to the way that manufacturing, like product companies do reliability engineering. So a problem is usually a defect out in the wild, um, out on the field, as they say. We bring in the, the product and we open it up and we do like a root cause analysis on it. And then we try to put controls on the production line to make sure that that kind of defect doesn't go out into the wild again. So it's kind of the same thing. Another way that we do that is look at data that is coming from the production line and looking at the trends in those data and the patterns in, those, in that data. Uh, it's funny because uh, the reason why I kind of directed my career to work in a cloud company is because I was hearing back in 2017 about people who were talking about, like uh, these folks who worked in AWS, talking about Edward Deming, uh, the guy who went to Toyota and uh, improved their car production lines. So I, I 
I don't remember who this was, but he was obsessed with Demi. And I was going like, huh, that's curious. I wonder why. Because this was what this is what I used to do before I worked in software. That's another story about how why I changed my career to software, but uh, we that's a that's a drink conversation. But um, yeah, I thought that was curious, and I'm noticing that because I'm working in a cloud company and I'm seeing all of this data coming in, if I squint enough, it kind of looks like that, and I think I get it. So this is what production line data looks like. People uh, in the production line, uh, there are te there's testing that's done. Uh, lots and lots and lots of measurements are taken. Uh, you got a widget. The widget is made, um, you know, stamped out. Whatever uh, measurements are taken. Uh, this is an example of it. The, they're taking measurements of solder height and the um, and uh, solder height is one of those like. You know, if, if it's too much solder, then that causes some resistance. And so um, the, your solder joint may not be that good. And so you kind of try and control the amount of solder height and you put targets to on where you want the solder height to be. And uh, if it goes over that line, then it's, you know, something needs to be done. So in order to do that, you have to take that solder height measurement again and again and again for every part. Uh, we kind of have something like this in software. Um, you see that on like uh, Git, GitHub Insights for your projects all the time. It's like they measure commit mess uh, commit logs or commit dates or the time takes to um, the time at which the commit was made. So it's kind of like that, not really, um, but it's getting there. So. This is what let's let's do let's do an experiment here. I'm sure you all heard about this event, uh, incident. <laughs> How do you feel about this? Like what are your feelings? <laughs> So, so for the for the stream, the uh, response is like, "Oh yeah, that thing." <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, this is like. This is like a really interesting, weird event. How often do you think of it, an event like this happens? You, you think it happens all the time? Small, a uh, small scale, more often. Okay. Um, well. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a that's a good observation that you do get a lot of updates that come up all the time and in fact this kind of update that caused this our crowd strike outage happens like many times a day so the update is common but that event really if you think about it is like a one of a kind kind of event a lot of things had to come into play in order for it to happen. So first lesson, failure is inevitable. This is a thing like people, I've heard software developers talk about entropy without really understanding what entropy is. So entropy is the direction that a system takes towards disorder. You start with a nice order system, and then it degrades. And that's why I have like the nice ice cube melting. Uh, 
This is something that production folks understand, physics folks understand. Things degrade. Uh, and you, ex you accept that. And you put controls in place to make sure that you detect the degradation at a threshold where you can, um, you can detect it and do something about it. We do this with electronics all the time. There's always like a control circuit that is in like whatever big circuitry that you're using. Software developers don't notice it because it's already in place, so they don't need to notice it. So all of those controls have already been in place and it took like 50 to 70 years of engineering work to get there. And you know, it, it, it sucks that like software engineers that I've talked, I've spoken to don't take that, like they take it for granted. Um, but there's a lot going on under the hood. Uh, so this is something that like, I feel like the first lesson is that failure will happen. It, it just will, and that's something that uh, you have to accept. And part of risk mitigation is trying to figure out, like trying to assess what risk is. And what risk is, is basically how much of danger can you take on? So we're not talking about um, like a measurement of risk, but more like what is your risk threshold? So let's do another exercise. Uh, what's the likelihood that one of these guys gets bitten by a shark? Unlikely. And why do you think that is the case? Mm-hmm. They're scared of people, yeah. But it could happen, yeah. So what are the things that you think may be causing a shark to bite a person? It's scared, or maybe it's curious, or maybe that person like bothered it and it got irritated. Maybe it's true, yeah, food supply is down, a shark may be hungry. Um, maybe that person smells good. I don't know. In <laughs> maybe that person looks too much like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe they look too much like uh, porp uh, what, porpoises or seals. Yeah, they, those flippers make them look like seals, don't they? Yeah. Mm, yummy people. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of uh, conditions that cause you to have more and more elevated risk. Um, and those conditions, like you can't really assess them very well without, you know, actually getting data. So all these things we're just we're just guesstimating. You know, there's not. We don't know anything about these people. We don't know what they know. Um, we do have like, you know, statistics that tell us that sharks, uh, like the the likelihood of a shark attack is one in four million versus the likelihood of dying of heart disease <laughs> is one in five. Yet, like, nobody is really saying I'm scared of heart disease. Um, people are scared of sharks. Um, this is a normal way of thinking. It's called uh, the availability bias. The availability bias says that things that are events that happen in very recent time, um, you think that they are more likely to occur. So a thing like CrowdStrike, that comes up in the news and you immediately think, oh, this happens a lot. But we actually don't know whether that's a thing that happens a lot or not. Um, and that's this is a very common bias that people have, and like a lot of folks take advantage of it. Um, 
but it is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about like what can go wrong with uh, software at scale. So typically, the high impact events are caused by systemic problems. This is uh, a list of all the supply chain security compromises. This is public. I got it from the CNCF GitHub. Um, I did a lot of like writing down of documents and making links so that Obsidian would make me this lovely graph. But um, what is interesting to note over here is that all of these supply chain attacks come from three places. Uh, either the source code is compromised, the dev tooling is compromised, or the publishing infrastructure is compromised. Three categories come up the most. Notice that things like malicious maintainer attacks do not show up. So GATAN is here, just not the most common thing. Uh, so if you zoom in into one, I chose publishing infrastructure, you'll find that like small decisions about um, how you set up your infrastructure lead to the most amount of problems. Um, you'll find that the one that's the most linked to is a download server hack. So you have a pipeline that you set up a server, that's the, ser that's the server that'll have like all of your downloaded, the artifacts that you're sharing with people to download. Um, somebody is able to hack into that server and either replace the artifact with a malicious artifact or will change the front end, um, the front end web page and replace links to malicious links. So that's the most common kind of compromise that happens. Uh, you'll notice that it's very, it's a very commonplace kind of thing that happens. Uh, it's it's not flashy, um, but it but it happens enough that it becomes a systemic problem, and it's happening because um, mostly like people are lazy or or they're not using the right tools, or they don't know how to use the right tools. You know, that's, a, that's kind of what we do with regards to risk management, is we try to find these underlying systemic problems because we know that those problems are what lead to this high imp uh, the high impact events that uh, hit the news. And then there are, some things that come up that we actually don't know anything about. I put this here because I thought this was really cool. <laughs> uh, and this, this uh, Wired article about uh, emergence of complex systems is also a really cool article. You should read it. Um, but what this is, is Jupiter's Great Red Spot. And Jupiter's Great Red Spot is one of those phenomena that nobody really knows why it happens. They just know that there are thermodynamic systems that are happening in like little, little clusters that just happen to create that big red spot. Uh, I do not necessarily see this in software, but it does happen with people. Uh, one of the examples that they give in this article is like when there are a bunch of people walking down the street, there, you if you are coming, you, if you're going, to, if you're seeing that you're going to cross paths with somebody, you will either go left or right. Uh, so many the, over, like so many people make this kind of decision that if you zoom out, you'll notice that they form streams of people. How did those streams come up? We don't know. Uh, and sometimes this happens when you're doing, you know, when you're running software at scale, when you're deploying software at scale, and it's something that you have to be aware of, and like, okay, you don't know why it's happening, but leave that to a side where it's like, you know, that's a mystery thing, and you can 
maybe data will come in later or you can do your analysis later to figure out why that happens but sometimes you don't know and that's okay so considering i brought up all of these things um this is the meat of the talk how do you overcome your availability bias you use data and not jira tickets <laughs> <laughs> I know that's like people think that's the source of truth but like there's so many there's so many other places where uh you can have the uh, true sources of tr truth about what ha what is happening with software production and deployment. And this is where I'd like to introduce you to a concept called statistical process control which happens in manufacturing. This is the first class that I had to take when I joined uh the manufacturing company. So Statistical process control is basically um plotting data points over the course of time and then putting controls over that data. And when you put controls over it, you can tell when something is like going out of trends uh out of control or headed towards that and then you can put mitigations. Um this is a control chart. it's not the only chart that is used in statistical process control uh and i'm going to show you other uh charts that i think are interesting and are useful when we are looking at software in particular so these are a few of my favorite charts uh this is the run chart uh you have seen this before if you've looked at github insights they are um it these are just commits that are plotted over time this is a uh, a chart that is plotting commits for like maybe five projects over the course of a year and you'll see like it goes up and down up and down up and down that's that's fine it it looks like it's chugging along uh What's cool about the run chart is that you if you plot enough of these over a, a period of time you'll actually be able to see trends in the chart. Uh this is the same data set but like it's plotted over the course of 5 years. So much longer than a year. Um what I wanted to show here is that this data is definitely available you just need to look at it at a much larger scale than what you're used to looking at so yes over the course of 5 years and 5 open source projects you can take you can plot this over a whole lot more open source projects um you may have to like clone all of them and uh plot them that way because GitHub may not you know show you this kind of data. So anyway, if you plot them over a the course of time, you will be able to see trends and that trend will tell you something about like the way those uh, the way that the software development is going like for this you see a trend going down, people are not committing uh as much anymore or uh, as time goes by. Okay. So this is a histogram Um uh, I like histograms because it kind of does this thing where it it takes um time uh data and converts it into like frequency data similar to like um Fourier transforms. So the way that you make a histogram is that you instead of taking those commits uh over a period of time, you count the number of commits that meet a certain condition and then you bin those conditions in like you take little little um intervals of that condition and put them on the x axis and then you plot the number of times the commits meet those conditions on the y axis so i've done that over here uh where i have binned um insertions and deletions i've added them up and i basically i cloned the linux kernel I took all of the commits, I counted the insertions and deletions for each of those commits and I binned them like I put intervals on the x-axis. And then I counted the number of commits on the y-axis. Um and this gives you 
something, some idea about like how changes are committed into the Linux kernel, you'll see that most of the commits uh, are like one line insertions and deletions. There are some that are a whole lot of insertions and deletions. There are some that are like kind of the same amount of insertions and deletions, but the takeaway from this is that most of them are one-line insertions and deletions. Interestingly, I did this for a number of other open source projects. Um, Kubernetes was one, Postgres was one, and they all had the same pattern. Um, I don't have it here, but that was a lot of cloning and extracting of commit messages um, it was, this is like, this is the worst part of doing data analysis as I found out, uh, is cleaning up of the data before you can plot them. Uh, so this data is not really available. You have to work in order to get it to a place where you can actually do this. But that was the surprising thing for me is that it's not just the Linux kernel that looks like this. A whole lot of other open source projects look like this too. Um, so that was, uh, Nice, curious uh, insight. Okay, the next one that I like is the scatter plot. Um, the scatter plot is basically plotting the one value against another value. And the reason you do this is that you're looking for correlations. Uh, if the scatter plot shows you a line that goes up, that's a positive correlation between the values on the x-axis and the values on the y-axis. Uh, if you see it go down, that's a negative correlation between the uh, values on the x-axis and the values on the y-axis. Positive correlation means the more you do x, the more y happens. Negative correlation means the more you do x, the less y ha happens. So here I am plotting insertions and deletions because Quite honestly, I thought it will give me like a nice positive scatter plot. So I was very surprised to see this kind of pattern um, where you have like a bunch of insertions and no deletions and a bunch of deletions and no insertions and like that little bit of a correlated line over there. So if you zoom in a little, you actually see like a situation where there are kind of an equal number of insertions and deletions. So there's a bunch of people, the bunch of developers and contributors of the Linux kernel that are actually doing like modifications of the code to make it do stuff versus, um, you know, adding, adding some new feature or removing some, you know, technical debt. So, and the fact that you have like all three lines like this looks like, you know, all three of them are well taken care of. Okay, the last one is, I think this is the last one. Yeah, it's the Pareto chart. Um, I love this one because it helps you prioritize and it like refutes a lot of assumptions that uh, people make with regards to like what events you should take care of and what events you, you shouldn't take care of. Um, the way you do a Pareto chart is, again, you count the number of instances, something happens, and then you uh, plot them in descending order. So that means the largest one that uh, has the most number of instances comes first. This is a chart of uh, Kubernetes dependencies by reference. Um, what that means is that for each of the dependencies, for each of the components on the x-axis, I want to count, or I've counted, how many times they are referenced by other dependencies. And then I plot them in descending order. So the one that is in the beginning, the one with the most number of references, that's the one that Kubernetes is most reliant on. That is the bottom most dependency and the most crucial one. Um, let's zoom in. You'll see that Kubernetes is dependent on sys. That's make, that makes sense. Um, the long one doesn't actually make sense in the beginning, but then when you think about 
how much of observability is needed in order to figure out whether like uh, an orchestrator is doing its job correctly or not is needed, it does make sense. Uh, gRPC kind of makes sense because you would think like, okay, you're working on a system and you have all of these microservices, they need to talk to each other. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, the API machinery, that, that one is weird to me. Um, someone needs to, someone who knows Kubernetes needs to like tell me what. <laughs> you don't see any surprises, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Interesting, huh? What's GoGo protobuf? Bundles and offers. So the uh, package for two. Uh, but I don't know if it's GoGo. Actually, you're right. I don't know if it's GoGo. That's a, so this one was actually the, oh, my, my information was from depths.dev. So it may not have had the most up-to-date version of this, but yeah, I mean, we can, we can work out whether, um, you know, it's actually the case right now or not. But yeah, this was, this was interesting. Um, and I'm so glad that you thought that was like insightful. <laughs> so. Anyway, to recap, um, we all have availability bias. We all have some assumptions about like the way that we produce software, the way that we deploy software and run software. Um, we need to have data in order to fight that availability bias. Don't feel bad about it because we all have it. Um, so you use run charts to find trends. You use histograms for patterns scatter plots for positive or negative correlations, and Pareto charts to prioritize. Uh, and I'll leave you with like the data is available, but you have to modify it. Um, it's a pain in the butt to modify, but it's definitely doable. Uh, okay, let's go back to CrowdStrike. <laughs> Why did it happen? <laughs> um, so there was a bug in the configuration validation tool. So that's why it didn't get caught because the validation tool had a bug that didn't catch it. Um, typically, people don't look at configuration files and think that that needs to be tested. Uh, that's like a, an assumption that people probably had to reduce cost or something like that. Uh, I get it, but it's, um, I mean, that may be in like a nest. <laughs> well, they learned their lesson. <laughs> I, 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 you know, that particular CTO has a track record of this kind of bug. Was he at this happen before? Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well. Sure. Microsoft shouldn't be co-signing this. Microsoft didn't co-sign. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But uh, Windows requires all kernel uh, drivers to be co-signed. You can get multi-track tracking. Well, no, that's fine. I mean, there's there's the code signing stuff. There's also the stuff that, like, you know, it's a it's a driver that got loaded before 
uh, the kernel got loaded and so you couldn't even roll it back. You had to manually boot the machine into fail safe in order to get it to work. So people are still dealing with it because yeah, their Windows machines are actually not accessible by a human. Uh, so that's, what? Oh, well, yeah, so assumptions, right? Yeah, um, but the takeaway from this is that um, failure is inevitable, <laughs> but not necessarily common. And the way you find the common systemic problems is you use data, and not the data that you're thinking about, not JIRA tickets, but <laughs> um, actual data from the source code that you're using from the metrics that you're getting out of your CI CD pipeline, your build and release pipeline, your deployment environments. That's the data that you need to be looking at. Uh, and then most of that data would normally fall in the common area, and that's where you need to prioritize when you're looking for problems. And that's it. Thank you very much. I think I'm just in time. Uh, it was like uh, 11.30, right? Yep. OK. Um, who's next? <laughs> I'm going to shut this down. But like, if anyone wants uh, to ask follow-up questions, like, um, let's uh, go ahead and do this. You want to look at that Kubernetes chart again, uh, Josh? Yeah, larger picture? Oh, you took a picture, okay. Yeah, so this is, um, so the the data set that I used is the one from devs.dev. So basically when they looked at the latest version of Kubernetes and um, got all of that data, That is that is not what that is not what the depth stop dev folks say like when they when they display it's a snapshot so it's whatever dependencies that kubernetes release which i believe is 1.30.3 yeah so this one uh, i mean i i i did this last week <laughs> so um yeah, it's the it's the most current uh, Kubernetes uh, thing. It could be that like if that doesn't gel with, you know, what you what like Kubernetes experts know, um, there may be a problem with the dev start dev dependency tree and like how they found out what these dependencies are. It's not surprising me that there are three. No, it doesn't surprise me either that there are uh, three different ones. Um, it also is like an indication that maybe like go dependencies like ought to be there ought to be a process to include some of those into the standard um standard library yeah um that's one way to avoid this i don't think they're like they could be kubernetes is production so i mean like so many people are deploying it it's running Performance, like operations data, mm -hmm. so like requests per second. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, observability loves metrics, uh, and they usually do this for uh, you know request and response times. Yes, um, we just need to apply it to the other data that we have in order to you know get information. This is this is all like we know this as machine learning. It's called SPC, statistical process control in manufacturing. In software it's called machine learning. Uh, so it's there. It's just that people don't apply it to places that they could apply it to. So yeah. It's funny we've like taken the term for manufacturing. It's like we literally call it production, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. But all their insights necessarily. Yep. Yeah. Um, Go ahead again. Oh, uh, geez, what? I did not even put that in there. 
No, there we go. There we go. That's what that's how you can get to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay then. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you. This was a fun talk.